Hey class, this is Roy again with a video lecture for chapter number six where we cover two topics. One is our favorite asset cash and another is a more conceptual topic called internal control where we're trying to safeguard assets like cash, like other assets, like inventory maybe in the past couple chapters. We also want to make sure with internal control steps and uh, and rules that we're going to have accurate financial records. So again, what's the purpose of this internal control? Again, to protect assets, like we'll see here in Chapter 6 for, for cash, and making sure we have accurate, reliable accounting records, accurate financial statements that we're learning to prepare throughout the whole semester, and we want to promote efficiency, maybe not here in Accounting 201, but more so in Accounting 202, to make sure we're using our assets effectively and efficiently. And one of the items we want to have our employees adhere to, to follow, is internal control policies, internal control procedures. So again, what's the purpose of internal control? Or why do we need internal control? Well, we're trying to stop as much as possible any types of mistakes or errors. Accidents, maybe not on purpose, okay, so basically the main one we've been learning so far is the use of debits and credits when we record transactions, when we record journal entries. At any one time we know the total debit and the total credits either for one transaction for or for everything they have to equal. So at any point in time if something doesn't balance we know something is wrong right there. That's an error or mistake right there. Or internal control can be used to prevent crimes, fraud, embezzlements, theft, misleading financial statements. That's probably the biggest thing. If you want to steal money you don't use a gun you learn how to use creative accounting to hide not maybe even mistakes but to make yourself look better than you really are to show more assets than you own to show that you're more profitable than you really are if you remember back in chapter one we learned a federal law called Sarbanes-Oxley or SOX one of the items in Sarbanes-Oxley is to make sure the company evaluates, checks its internal control system to make sure all the safeguards are there to prevent major mistakes and major fraud. And one of the key people that have to uh, check this besides the company itself is the CPAs that audit the company. They have to express an opinion not on those financial statements, remember the balance sheet, income statement, cash flow, but also you have to evaluate and report on the company's internal controls. This applies directly to very large companies called publicly traded companies, but these rules also have been pushed down to very small mom and pop companies too, if they get audited. We're gonna, if you read chapter six, you're gonna see all of these items covered in more detail about how you can increase a company's internal control, increase the uh, safeguards. But um, I'll leave most of that to your reading. Now you gotta read the textbook. Watching this video is a supplement to your reading. Keeping in mind now, when you have internal controls, there's some cost to it. You're going to spend more time, have more uh, procedures set up. Things start to slow down with more internal control. But of course, the benefit is that you're safeguarding your assets. You're making sure your accounting records are accurate as possible. So you got to weigh the benefits and the costs here. You can have lots and lots of controls, but it may be too costly more than what it's worth. We're specifically going to see here um, applying internal control procedures to our cash asset. And this applies not just to cash but to any asset. What you want to do is separate the actual handling of the asset. In the case of cash, it would be a cashier or the treasurer, the treasury department of a big company. Separate that money function with the record keeping. This is really what we're learning 
in our class the accounting in, for cash or other assets or other types of accounts so a group of people handles cash and they should not have any access to the record keeping they have some documents but they don't handle the bookkeeping part that we're learning and the bookkeepers of very large or medium-sized organizations shouldn't be handling any cash so if you want to cover up any theft or mistake you have to have access to both the asset and the record keeping or you have to have collusion between people okay so separating the duties here the responsibilities is one way to protect your asset here whenever you receive cash cash receipts probably it's maybe through the mail or through a cash register you shouldn't spend any money out of this amount of receipts you should take the whole thing and deposit it right away what we call intact without taking any money out so now there's going to be a trail you can follow the amount you receive whatever documents I have here will match the deposit ticket the deposit slip when you take it to the bank and eventually it will match the monthly bank statement that you get we'll see later later in an example so you have this trail of confirmation here now when you spend money disbursements the best way to do that is with your checking account probably writing checks because on this piece of paper this check you're gonna have the date the amount written twice who you're paying probably what you're paying for and it's gonna match up with other types of documents so paying with currency and coins you try to avoid that as much as possible so what is cash well most people people picture in their mind the paper money that's called currency you know those dollar bills with Washington on them or let's see Andrew Jackson on the 20 Grant on the 50 Grant was on the 100 I can't even remember oh Benjamin Franklin I think it's on the 100 I don't handle hundred dollar bills meaning that's your paper money yeah but also coins is cash but the main way we hold our cash is really in bank accounts so all of this usually represents cash account although we keep track of these individually and in the case of a bank account the main bank account is a checking account where you can spend money with writing checks of course you would write uh, make deposits and then write checks to spend some things that you hold with uh, in your in your possession like customer payments you receive or cashier's checks you have all of this is also considered to be cash so typically on a financial statement they would group all of this together and just give you one big figure for their cash amount the cash balance even things close to cash like investment securities that you can go online or call up your broker and convert it to cash right away is considered to be cash or cash equivalent so let's take a look or talk about an example where you're selling with a cash register over the counter like a retail store okay so an internal control procedure is to use cash registers where you would ring up the sale on the register and collect the money so typically that register is the responsibility of a cashier the cashier would start off with a certain amount of money called a change fund and then during the day he or she would collect more money in the register and by the end of the shift or end of the day the amount collected the additional cash collected in the register should equal to the amount that was rung up on the register remember ringing up sales we record sales revenue right plus revenue at the same time we're collecting the money and here's the cash coming in either by currency and coins or even the charges to the credit cards or debit cards is cash or collecting checks is cash okay so they have to match up what you collect has to equal what's rung up on the register and of course it's going to be a mistake sometimes maybe the amount you collect is less than the amount rung up on the register or the amount collect is bigger than the amount rung up on the register less likely right the customer probably would correct you the cashier if you had short changed them and not so the other way around yeah okay so again using a register that you cannot change automatically unless you have some type of managers or, or, or um, supervisors approval 
yeah, to change this so you don't artificially try to match it up with the wrong amount or in, um, in less embezzled amount of cash. You're comparing these two here. And then if you bill your customer, you may receive the money. Here this is a cash, but could probably be checks. You don't want to receive currency and coins through the mail. Here it says maybe you should have two people. Again, this is costly, right? The cost versus the benefit. Opening up the mail. And this is probably should not be your accountant, should not be cashiers. Probably it's the mail clerks. And what they would do is separate out the money. Eventually that's going to be passed on to the cashier who's going to deposit the money to um, the bank. And keeping track of who uh, the money came from, writing up a list. Or there's something called a uh, remittance advice. Your remittance advice that's part of the bill that the customer may cut off and send back to you with the payment that would be part of this list here and this listing goes to the accountant that would journalize the cash collected without seeing the cash and crediting probably not sales you already recorded the sale yeah when you had sent them the bill but probably crediting the accounts receivable reducing that asset that the uh, customer now owes you or had owed you Okay, so again, a separation of duties. Who handles the money and who uh, accounts for the money, records the, the money. So when you spend cash, disperse cash, as much as possible, you try to do it by check coming out of your bank account. In the, but in the case of small payments, maybe it's easier to pay out the currency and coins. If that's the case, you would set up something called a petty cash fund. But let's first take a look at the record keeping for spending money with uh, checks here called a voucher system. So a voucher system is basically making sure that everything is accurate, everything matches up all the pieces of paper before you actually spend the money. So there's lots of pieces of paper. Here's a diagram that's in our chapter six. So it all starts way, way down here. Before you even buy something, someone has to request it in your company. So let's say that I'm in my, my marketing department and I wanna buy a computer. So what I would do is fill out a requisition form and get my supervisor's approval and then they would pass that on to a business office, possibly called a purchasing department. They would make sure that I'm not uh, um, buying something that I don't need, making sure that maybe that it's within the budget of my department. And only then would they place the order with the vendor, send the order to the vendor, making sure I get a copy of that. Yeah? And then I would receive that computer. I may receive, uh, fill out a receiving form, but basically all I'm doing is saying I'm confirming with the uh, accounting department that I got the computer. And only then they would match it up with the bill they get. Okay, the bill. And now they can pay it off and here write the check. So lots of documentation along the way that have to match up. And all of these documents put together is called a voucher. So if you remember the main liability account we record is called accounts payable, increase with the credit. Every time we buy something, debit that thing and credit the liability. Instead of using an accounts payable account, Basically, if you have a voucher system, you just call this now a, a voucher payable. Yeah, you recall the liability when this invoice is, re is recorded. And then when you pay it off here, the check, you reduce the liability. Spending cash. Now for small payments that writing checks is impractical, what we can do is use a petty cash fund. Sometimes they call this an impress system. So the way to set up first a petty cash fund is to get a check, here it looks like from the cashier, for a certain dollar amount, uh, the size of the fund looks like it's going to be $400, written out to cash really, 
and given to someone called a petty cash custodian who's going to handle that petty cash. Okay, and here our accountant, another person, is doing the bookkeeping, taking the money out of our checking account called cash, reducing that asset, and increasing another cash asset debit here called petty cash. Of course, you can't spend this check, so this cashier, the custodian, has to take the cash has to take the check to the bank and cash it to get currency and coins to make change, to make payments. And he or she would put it into some type of locked looks like a safe here, but most people just keep it in a box, a strong box or a cigar box and they put it in a locked drawer. So this custodian is the only person that has access, that has responsibility over this petty cash fund. So sitting in this box right now is $400 of currency and coins. Now we can start taking money out to, pay, to make small payments. So here you're taking out amounts to pay for postage, to pay for delivery. Now whenever you take money out, you got to replace what's in the petty cash fund with some type of receipts going back in equal to the amount of cash that was spent or better yet you can have them also fill out in addition to collecting the receipts have them fill out a voucher a petty cash voucher with name date signing that they got the money and putting it back here in the in the fund so in the petty cash fund you still have currency and coins and now receipts and if you add up all of this the total should still be the size of the petty cash fund, $400. Eventually over time, the currency and coins will go down and the receipts will go up. But the total has to still equal the size, the original size of the fund. So let's say that you're running low of currency and coins here. What you need to do is reimburse or replenish the fund. So what you're going to do is take all those receipts out and summarize them. Here in this case we have $45 of postage, $80 of delivery and totaling you're going to ask our company cashier to write another check for those receipts. Okay, here in this case $125 worth. Again made out to cash. So again our petty cashier will take this to the bank and cash it and throw that currency and coins with the balance we had in there before bringing up the currency and coin balance to that $400 amount. These receipts here should probably be marked paid or perforated so they cannot be used again to draw another check. Now when this check is drawn, you're going to journalize it. Again, cash going out. This is the checking account cash decrease with the credit. But notice the debit here. It's not to petty cash. That was used when we set up the fund. Here what you're doing is, again is replenishing or reimbursing the fund matching the receipts, debiting those costs here, the expenses. Now if for some reason you're missing cash or you got too much cash, you have to account for that because the size in here has to be 400. So if you're short, you're going to have an account called cash over and short being debited for that missing cash. Or for some reason you have overages probably because you um, Let's see, how, what would the cause of that? Have a receipt that you didn't pay for whatever reason. You would have a credit here showing that you got extra money. But then again, the money you actually collect to replenish the fund would be this being drawn out. And the size here shouldn't change from that original 400. So let's say now we're going to go to the checking account, the bank account. So lots of documents here to work with. When you deposit money, here's a document called a deposit slip or deposit ticket. Here when you spend money, it's going to be those checks you write. And it's all going to now be summarized probably at the end of the month on a bank statement. What we want to do is make sure the bank statement we get showing this amount on this date matches what we say we have so if you look at your cash account, remember this represents the, like the T account for cash, 
collecting money, debit, spending money, credit. And then here's the balance, the running balance at the end of the month, the same date as our bank statement. But if you look at the balance, the bank balance and our book balance, it doesn't match. Well, we got to reconcile. We got to find out what causes the difference here by preparing a document called a bank reconciliation. The main reason why there's difference between these two amounts, what you say you have and what the bank says you have in your checking account, is just due to timing differences. The bank has done things during the month that you may not be aware of. And you may have done things that the bank wasn't aware of. So you have to go through the bank statement, you have to go through your ledger and try to match up amounts. Things that match up mean that they're both here and here. Things that don't match means that it's only on one side, only on one side. And those are the reconciling items you gotta report on a bank reconciliation. And the simple math we do in accounting is either add or subtract, right? Add or subtract. But what you're going to do is divide up your adding and subtracting into two parts of the reconciliation. One, starting with the bank balance, what the bank says you have in your checking account. And then here, what you say you have in your checking account by looking at the cash general ledger. Again, either adding or subtracting. Now what you're adding or subtracting here are things that the bank had done that you weren't aware of as of the end of the month. And likewise, here what you're adding and subtracting to the bank balance is what we did, our company did, that the bank wasn't aware of at the end of the month. So this reconciliation is really done after the month is over when you can find out these differences. Again, there's going to be two parts to the bank reconciliation. Reconciling the bank balance and the book balance. And when you get a total, let me go back to the previous slide. When you total up this column, bank balance add and subtract, you're going to get a correct adjusted cash balance. And here you start off with the book balance add and subtract adjustments. You're going to have the same adjusted balance. These two got to match Otherwise, you have not reconciled your checking account. So let's take a look at an example. Here we have a bank statement and it shows at the end of the July we have $9,610. We're Simmons Company now and we're dealing with our bank and according to our records, the general ledger account, we have a debit balance of $7,430. And because the two amounts are differ, differing, we got to prepare a bank reconciliation. So most times for simple personal accounts, what you would do is flip over the bank statement paper and there's going to be a form to help you reconcile the difference. But here for a business, we got to prepare a report. So here is a list of reconciling items. In this example, we're just given these six different amounts. In a real life situation, you would be looking at the bank statement. You would be looking at the general ledger or something called a, a check register to find differences or try to match up items between the two. And the things that you cannot match up are going to be these items here, the reconciling items. So uh, let's um, go through an illustration here. So let's say that here is our company. Uh, I think it was called Simmons, right? Simmons? This is our company. And here's our bank. Let's call it S Bank. So during the month, we're writing, oh, let's put down the balances. The bank says, according to that bank, um, statement, you have um, $9,610 and according to your general ledger, your cash ledger, you have, let me go back here, $7,430.
debit balance. I know my handwriting is ugly, but I don't want to touch the tools down here. Okay, and because they don't match, you got to prepare reconciliation. So the first reconciling item mentioned is these something called outstanding checks, 2416. So let's show an example of how a check flows among all the different parties here. So we're Simmons, we're writing a check. Okay, here's a check. And let's say it goes to our, our vendor people we buy stuff stuff from vendor or supplier and then our vendor would take this check to their bank depositing it into their checking account and their bank would contact our bank probably electronically nowadays to make sure we have enough money to cover that check and then reduce the balance okay we know we wrote the check so we reduced our balance and our bank only knows we spent the money when they get notification from this bank here but we're told here at the end of the month there's two thousand four hundred seventeen dollars of checks that are still out there that hasn't reached our bank again this is um, checks being written totaling two thousand four hundred seventeen dollars so we sent it to the vendor we wrote the check so we reduced our balance to this uh, 7430 and maybe the vendor is just holding the checks they haven't deposited yet so our bank doesn't know about those checks and it hasn't reduced the balance here so when we prepare the reconciliation to match these two amounts we're gonna subtract out the outstanding checks, yeah, outstanding checks from the bank balance. It's already subtracted out from our book balance. Okay, we're trying to match up the two, make them closer with each reconciling item. The second reconciling item is a $500 check mailed uh, to the bank as a deposit, but it hasn't reached the bank as of the end of the month. Okay, so we collected money let's say now we're dealing with a uh, a customer the customer had sent us a check for 500 and we recorded it as a debit and then we sent it to the bank and then typically they would increase our balance here but when we sent it to the bank it was the end of the month it's still on the way this $500 we call this a deposit in transit on the way yeah it's in here our book balance we know we got the money and deposited but it's not here as of the end of the month so just like outstanding checks it's still on on the way and on the bank reconciliation we're gonna add this 500 to the bank's balance this 9610 okay it's in here already and we still have to add it to the bank balance and that's gonna make the difference even bigger now but we still have more reconciling items Number three, reconciling item, the bank returned a customer's NSF check. Customer meaning our customer now. And NSF means not sufficient funds. This is a bad check. Someone was writing checks that they didn't have money in their checking account. $225. Okay, and it was uh, a payment we had collected on an account receivable so let's start from the beginning again so here's our customer and they wrote us a check for $225 what we had done was debited cash to get this balance and we had credited we had credited at the same time accounts receivable reducing the amount the customer owes us now we took this $250 check and we deposited it so the bank increased their balance but then when our bank presented the check to our customers bank they found out that our customer didn't have enough money in their checking account so sometimes we call this bounce check it bounces back and our bank now reduces it reduces our balance for that bounce check they may even charge us a fee for that but we don't know that until the month is already over so it's in here the 225 and it's not in here okay our balance is not correct that was not a good deposit 
So what we got to do is reduce our book balance by $225. We're going to be crediting cash. Now keep in mind, you're going to have to debit something else, yeah? So if you remember what you credited before here, you now got to debit. You got to increase the account receivable from this customer who now owes you this money because they gave you a bad check. Okay? Um, NSF checks are an adjustment to our book balance on the reconciliation. Let's take a look at number four. The bank statement shows $30 of interest earned during July and it's already in the bank statement balance but we don't know that until the month is already over. So on the reconciliation we're going to add, we're going to debit cash and probably credit a revenue, maybe interest earned or interest uh, revenue. Number five, and these are the harder ones now to spot and probably record. A check for 718, not check number 781 for supply expense cleared the bank for $286. So this is the amount of the check here, but then we recorded it, we journalized it incorrectly in our, in our journal, in our ledger, in our books for this wrong amount. Okay, The check is correct. We just recorded it incorrectly in our book. Now also another situation would be just the opposite. The check is wrong and we recorded it incorrectly. So you gotta watch out now how um, the error is made. And we made the error, the company, Simmons made the error, not the bank. So let's see if I can draw this out. 268. We wrote a check to a vendor for $268. And it went through their bank and to our bank. And our bank reduced it, the balance down to this amount here by $268. But when we recorded this check, what we did was subtract out not 268 but 240 or let's see what is that $28 short this number here is too big we call that overstated by 28 so on the bank reconciliation we're gonna subtract out $28 we're gonna credit cash with 28 so when we do that credit what are you gonna debit credit cash debit we got to go back and figure out what did you originally credit when you wrote this check it was according to this probably supply expense supply expense has to now be debited another twenty eight dollars when you credit cash for twenty eight okay last adjustment a four hundred eighty six dollar deposit by Acme now who's Acme remember we're Simmons was erroneously credited by to our account by our bank. Hmm. Here is Acme. Isn't that the company in the Roadrunner cartoons? And they made a deposit of 486. But what happened, the bank had credited your account, increasing your account by 486. I really should say debit, yeah? Although you didn't do that because you didn't know this mistake was made. I wish you could keep the cash here, but it's not yours. So if it's a bank mistake, on the bank reconciliation report, you're going to fix up the bank's balance, not yours, which is correct. You didn't record this deposit. You're going to subtract out that deposit from this amount here. Okay, so summarizing all of this on a bank reconciliation report, okay, our company, Simmons, a bank wreck as of the end of the month. Notice the starting point here, bank balance. This is the first half. In fact, you have to chop this report in half right here. The first part starts off with a bank balance. The second part starts off with our general ledger book balance, both as of the same date. And because they're different, you got to prepare this report, accounting for all the differences. Here are things that the bank had done or the bank mistakes that we weren't aware of as of this date or the bank wasn't aware of as of this date. And here is stuff the bank had done that we weren't aware of or had made mistakes during the month. Okay. 
So deposit and transit, it's already in here, not in here. We add outstanding checks, already subtracted from our number. Now you got to subtract it from the bank's number. And here's that uh, Acme Company deposit that's in here and shouldn't be in here, right? And of course, we didn't record that. I wish we could put it in our, our balance. Interest being earned, it's already in here, not here, so we add NSF checks. Remember that bounce check? When we deposit it, we put it in. When it bounced, we didn't know that until now, after the month is over, so we subtract. If we make a mistake, not the bank now, but if we make a mistake, that mistake is either going to be adding to, or in this case, subtracting. We didn't subtract out enough when we wrote the check that was correct, that was processed by the bank and subtracted out of here. And the moment of truth is that this number here, the adjusted bank balance, has to match your adjusted book balance. If not, something is wrong. Maybe you got one item in the wrong place, or you should be adding instead of subtracting. Okay? Always think now, is this number too big or too small? Do I have to add or subtract to correct it? Whose correction is it? Is it the bank or our company? Now, just because you prepared this bank reconciliation doesn't mean your cash is now this. It's still this. The only way to change any account is to journalize the change. And here's what you journalize. Add debit cash. The question now is what you're going to credit. No, interest revenue. Here, subtract cash. Credit cash. Now, what you're going to debit? Well, here, this is the account receivable, yeah? Customer now owes you money, that bounce check. And this error, the little bit harder one, is probably that supply expense we didn't debit enough when we first recorded that wrong amount. So, journalizing. Here's your general journal entries. Increase cash, debit. Decrease cash, credit. The hard part is not what you're going to credit when you debit cash, but you're going to debit when you credit cash. Okay. Now you journalize this and you post it to your cash account and now it's updated to the correct balance you saw on the reconciliation reported twice. Okay. Here as of the end of the month. Now you're already doing this in August, yeah? You're already recording August transactions, but then you also go back and redate this for the reconciling items to make this as of that date. Yeah, you had this amount of cash as of July 31st. At the end of every chapter, we have some type of ratio or analysis. In this case, we're looking at the receivables we have at the end of the year, comparing that with all the sales we sold on account okay, uh, during the year, net of any discounts and allowances. You know? And this would represent the portion of our sales that still are collectible at the end of the year. And if you multiply that by 365 days, it tells you how many days probably we have outstanding to collect, sales to collect. And as much as possible, we want this to be a small number. We'll see another ratio next chapter, chapter 7, also dealing with these two amounts. Okay, but this is the ratio, end of chapter uh, 6. Okay, questions? Come to the live class meeting or email me. Otherwise, make sure you work on, timely work on your Learn Smart and your uh, homework assignments. A lot of uh, interactive videos, but make sure you work on the bank reconciliation. That's the last two problems for homework. Okay, talk to you later.